thank you very much vakas for giving me this opportunity to start the session um first of all i mean i think khushir khan he is not here with us likewise our scientific chair abbas raza uh it gives me a great, great pleasure that pakistan endocrine society this time had this pilot of virtual conference and by the looks of it i think it has gone pretty successful with uh, this pilot project that we had uh, we were specially assigned this um, session on women health again this was something very innovative for first time that i have been a part of pakistan endocrine society we had a, a separate section or a separate agenda for this topic and i'm very pleased to introduce our first speaker for today dr azra rizwan uh, who is one of the senior most endocrinologist of the country uh, in fact the pioneers if i can say and she is a very humble person i mean i know her for a very long long time during her training days uh, she is a consultant endocrinologist ba based at akhan university besides her fellowship and training program in endocrine and clinicals she has also done masters in clinical research and her masters basically involves school based study on risk factors of overweight obesity in children and adolescents and i must commend azra this is something that is needed today so you did something retrospectively that was our need for today as well so something very relevant likewise she is currently working on rct to assess the impact of various combinations of anti diabetic medications on nafel again something very very interesting and she also had presented and i think published a review on a lady presenting with severe osteoporosis which was ultimately found to have parathyroid cancer so it's over to you saira uh, please begin your session thank you very much all right assalamu alaikum thank you so very much uh, sobia for that kind introduction and i would like to thank the organizers pakistan endocrine society or the panelists here who took the time out to um be here today so uh today i'll be talking about um osteoporosis and what what the need is to investigate this condition in a country with limited resources such as ours so the outline of my talk is such so that i'll be first talking about Uh, giving a brief definition of osteoporosis and osteoporotic related fractures then i'll be going on to describe um the scene that exists globally followed by a little bit uh, about the osteoporosis fracture risk assessment and then what the scene is like in um, for osteoporosis in our region and suggestions for the way forward so the national institute of health consensus development has defined osteoporosis as a systemic skeletal disorder that leads to a compromised bone strength and increased risk of fracture and bone strength um is is reflected by both bone density and bone quality now what are fragility fractures basically they are low trauma fractures that occur as a result of a force that is either equal to or less than that from falling from a standing position and so the reason for calling this a fragility fractures because patients with normal bones people with normal bones should not fracture from this position and any degree of fracture sustained as a result of this kind of force minimal force um you know is abnormal so extreme pain and disability are the consequences and um in the end there can be uh, you know there's a complete low quality of life with even complete dependence on caregivers now when you re review the literature in the internationally um despite the various advances in the diagnosis of osteoporosis and also the treatment modalities there have been low rates of investigating and treating fragility fractures that have been reported um uh, internationally now even in studies reporting high rates of osteoporosis there was a moderate um you know institution of pharmacotherapy and lifestyle intervention barriers identified included the cost of therapies and cost of diagnostic modalities it's important to remember that even in the west um you know not insurance policies do not uh, do not exist in all regions equally so 
and there also there was lack of clarity on responsibility of care. Who should you know be responsible for managing osteoporosis? Is it the orthopedic, rheumatologist, endocrinologist? And so in that uh, kind of you know, dilemma, the patient gets lost somewhere in the way. So ownership of this condition needs to be done. It can be done collaboratively. It's no one's you know, uh, territorial domain, but everyone should have a good knowledge. All the care providers should have a good knowledge of how to you know, identify the risk factors and subsequent management for osteoporosis. So a lot needs to be done in the developed world. So you can begin to imagine what the scene uh, would be like in in areas where there are limited resources. So data on osteoporosis and fragility fractures um, are, you know, there's a huge dearth of data in that direction. And so to address this question, um, a group from the Alpha University, it went over articles from Google Scholar that, um, you know, reviewed studies between 1990 to 2017. And they, the Relevant search terms included osteoporosis, uh, osteopenia, vitamin D, bone tumor markers, risk factors for osteoporosis in Pakistan, as well as fragility fractures. Now, before I go on to present, you know, the findings of the study, I would just like to go over a little, uh, you know, about osteoporosis fracture risk assessment. Now, a good and clinical history and physical examination and routine x-rays, they actually define um, osteoporosis in the advanced stages of the disease. Right, and the first low trauma fracture in a previously asymptomatic individual is often the first um, indication of osteoporosis in an individual once the person is fractured. And a first fracture, having said that, is a major risk factor for subsequent fractures occurring in the individual. And that usually occurs within the year of sustaining the index fracture. So it is quite, um, you know, it, it's the primary aim is to diagnose a person before the event of the first fracture, if we are to go anywhere in this, to, you know, anywhere meaningful in this area. So where bone densitometry is concerned, that is basically a measure of risk. It is not the be all and end all for diagnosis. And information on bone mass through bone densitometry needs to be added, needs to be combined with clinical risk factors. To get, uh, and also non-skeletal risk factors like the fall, you know, potential to fall, um, imbalance, et cetera, et cetera, that exists in the elderly. And then the risk benefit of intervention can be discussed with the patient. So there are a number of uh, BMD independent factors as well. This risk factors for low bone mass, for fall, risk factors for fat fracture that can be used to target indi individuals for subsequent investigation and treatment. Now, this actually um, divides the clinical ev evaluation of bone health based on risk factors. And there are a number of intrinsic causes, risk factors for fall and risk factors for fracture. Important are increasing age, right? Where endocrine causes are concerned, it's very important to look for secondary osteoporosis in a person. Um, usually the clinical evidence for that is apparent at that time. Someone with hyperthyroidism, Cushing syndrome will be usually picked up clinically. And uh, there are a number of gastrointestinal and nutritional factors, lifestyle, uh, GI malabsorption, such as celiac disease, for instance, that can be associated with both osteoporosis and osteomalacia. Then risk factors for fall, there's a huge risk, most important, of course, reduced vision that occurs with increasing age, muscle weakness, uh, long depression, use of drugs, multiple drugs, sedatives, diuretics that can predispose a person to fracture and falling. And also extrinsic factors, very important to remember, such as lack of stair handrails lack of effective bathroom grab bars and dim lighting of rooms. Risk factors for fracture, these are holistic ones which are combined risk factors for low bone mass and risk factors for fall. History of smoking is very, very important um, to uh, ask for and address and uh, low body weight, chronic illness, any form of chronic illness can predispose because of the new two fracture due to nutritional deficiency and use of cortical steroids, of course, which is prevalent in the society as you'll be um, seeing in the forthcoming slides. Now, um, there's a limited accuracy of BMD alone, as I mentioned, in fracture risk prediction. And this has come, um, this has led to the development of various clinical tools, fracture risk assessment tools, which combine the various factors that we've just discussed, clinical factors with uh, BMD findings uh, to improve fracture risk prediction. And these tools um, qualitatively predict 10 year probability of hip and major osteoporotic fractures. Major osteoporotic fractures include hip fractures, spinal fractures and that of the wrist and humerus. So um, the, the, the caveat here is that these are country specific thresholds. There are country specific thresholds for fracs and um, uh, this has not been validated in Pakistan. And so we usually use the, the closest country which is India to uh, assess the 
you know, risk factors through FRAX, uh, FRAX tools available online. But having said that, work on this is ongoing, and inshallah, we'll have FRAX tools available for our country as well. So um, getting on to the scenario in Pakistan and getting back to that research analysis that was done of the various studies that were published. Now, in the absence of national registries and published data, there's a dearth of strong, robust epidemiological data on osteoporosis in Pakistan. The diagnostic facilities are not widespread. There are a limited number of DEXA machines available only in the large cities of the country. And in the last five years, um, the prevalence of osteoporosis in you know, most of the studies was documented through heel ultrasound, very few through um, you know, the gold standard of, DEX, of DEXA. Um, so where the knowledge status for osteoporosis was concerned, there was uh, expected a low level of um, you know, the CAP studies that were done on this knowledge assessment practice. There was a low level of osteoporosis knowledge in the country, even most healthcare professionals. Individual efforts have been instituted, people working in silo, but no strong government policies are, have been in place and it has not been recognized as a major health issue in our um, you know, policy agendas, health policy agendas. And the reason linked to this, um, to this is the low level of education that prevail, prevails in the country, infrequent contact with health services of our females, particularly who are very busy, you know, taking care of everyone in the household but themselves. And so that this, you know, kind of removes that, that potential contact that can give them advice on primary care, preventive care for future fractures, such as diet and, you know, cessation of you know, drugs that are necessarily given to them. And um, also, uh, you know, some more advice on the kind of physical activity they should be embarking upon to prevent future factor risk. And of course, the poor economic conditions that prevail in the community. So uh, that being said, having said that about that um, knowledge, this, there was a study on healthy females attending tertiary care hospitals in which they randomly selected Pakistani women coming from the more affluent backgrounds and um, those from coming from the lower socioeconomic um, uh, areas. And they found there was a significantly better knowledge from you know, individuals as expected from the richer backgrounds as compared to the lower uh, economic state, uh, status people. But this knowledge did not improve the lifestyle habits for osteoporosis. So that was concerning. And other tertiary hospitals, it didn't translate into practice that knowledge. Another tertiary hospital study um, that was done, it, it documented low rates of calcium and vitamin D supplementation for patients when they were discharged after surgery for hip fracture. So again, that was an opportunity missed. Now, um, although, as I've said before, there's a scarcity, a dearth of good data on um, the osteoporosis prevalence and fracture prevalence in Pakistan, the risk factors, the known risk factors that we know from uh, globally, from global studies, um, such as multi-priority, increased postmenopausal years, low calcium intake, vitamin D deficiency, and low physical activity are on the rise, right? So, um, this, the, the, so osteoporosis prevalence uh, is, is definitely on the rise as well. So you kind of extrapolate that. The risk factors from Peshawar was once determined in a study published recently, and uh, they also documented age of menopause, menarche, uh, number of pregnancies, history of personal fracture, smoking, and various drugs that were given to these individuals, including steroids, homeopathic meds, um, you know, inadvertent, inadvertent use of steroids that were responsible for um, predisposing to these individuals to fracture. Now, the mean, um, there was a community-based study in which they calculated the mean calcium intake in uh, 140 postmenopausal women. And it was much less in the the, than the one, um, the intake level recommended by the World Health Organization. And significant osteoporosis was found in 103 postmenopausal females who um, had sustained hip fracture. Again, early menopause, low BMI, injudicious use of steroids, poor visual acuity were also factors in determining this um, onset of hip fracture. And steroids, as you know, homeopathic, Hakimi medication, a lot of them were using that um, when, when historically was probed. Uh, as to what drugs they were on. The mean age of the study group was 64.6 years and the average menopause duration at the time of hip fracture was 9.9 .9 years. And the study reported lack of physical activity, that is sedentary activity in up to 71% of women in this uh, you know, study. Now, uh, where bone turnover is concerned, osteoporotic fractures have been documented to occur 10 to 20 years earlier in um, people coming belonging to the Indo-Pak region than those compared with uh, the West. 
in a cross-sectional study in which they studied the relative contributions of ethnicity, reproductive history, body size, bone turnover, vitamin D, di vitamin D levels, that is dietary intake of calcium to the femoral bone marrow density in hip axis length in Indians and Pakistanis and Caucasians, because the short hip axis length in Indians, Pakistanis could attenuate the risk of osteoporosis. But uh, Pakistan Indian women had lower BMD when they adjusted for other factors than their American counterparts and a lower vitamin D level and higher markers of bone turnover, the entilopeptide was the one that was measured, was found in Asians as compared to the uh, Western counterparts. Now this fact, couples with their lower bone mineral density placed them at a very high risk for osteoporosis. Now, no study is complete on osteoporosis without uh, mentioning vitamin D. Now vitamin D, is, as you all know, it has been, is, it has been associated with everything ranging from uh, you know, cardiovascular disease, stroke, and uh, now it's COVID-19, there's studies on that as well. And also it has been a controversial uh, topic. Whenever there's a study, there's, a, there's a, uh, a contradictory study that comes out saying that no, there is no such association. But in this particular area, this is where vitamin D has beyond doubt established itself as a main determinant of bone health in conjunction with vitamin D. And this has been um, verified from studies from you know, all over the globe, including uh, local studies, which have um, documented high prevalence of deficiency, including a national, um, fairly recent national nutrition survey in which they found the deficiency to be as high as 68.5% amongst pregnant individuals as compared to 66.2% in non-pregnant. Now, despite the ample sunshine, Pakistan is you know, one of the, the countries with the highest rates of this deficiency. And that is probably related to the fact that although there is sunshine it is there, but exposure is not. And there were studies that linked it to constant, you know, wearing of the veil in females, um, that, you know, lack of exposure that led to this kind of deficiency. So in the absence of, uh, um, in, a, in a study to assess bone health in, in a healthy adult population, they took some, um, a randomly selected population of premenopausal women. They found a high bone turnover seen in healthy premenopausal women in conjunction with low vitamin D levels. So in the absence of sunlight exposure, the body is completely dependent on the dietary supply for vitamin D, right? And uh, unfortunately, um, as, as you know, opposed to the West where there are you know, strong robust fortification policies in place for vitamin D and calcium supplementation, there are lack of such mandatory fortification policies in Pakistan. And furthermore, international recommendations for the optimal vitamin D dose and the, um, you know, the desired levels of vitamin D and calcium that should be taken may not apply locally. And uh, in this context, based on food frequency questionnaires, the calcium intake was very low as compared to that, you know, that was documented in the West. So getting on to hip fracture prevalence, despite the high prevalence of osteoporosis and osteopenia, there, uh, there's a dearth of data again on the prevalence and incidence of hip fracture in the nation. Mortality rates are not available. Information on quality of life is almost non-existent. And such rates have been documented to be up to 20, 35% in the West, three folds higher, and also three folds higher than that in the Middle East. So, you know, in our uh, community is bound to be even higher than this. Now, uh, getting on to the lifestyle factors, it has been uh, proven beyond doubt that up to 40% of adult bone mass uh, you know, uh, is accounted for by lifestyle factors. And this is endorsed by the National Osteoporosis Foundation. And lifestyle modification therefore is a key, key strategy to reduce osteoporosis risk in the elderly. And um, based on community-based study from, from a center, there were significant predictors of vitamin D deficiency, such as aging, a residence and housing structure that were found to be associated. Now, um, what is important to remember is the peak bone mass is attained in very early years at the age of, in the, in, it's in the early twenties that one attains a peak bone mass. So this is the area, this is a time when right from early childhood through to adolescence and um, you know, early adulthood, that is when your bones will be maximally mineralized and you need to um, institute these kind of lifestyle factors early in life in order to, to, to delay the risk of osteoporosis in the later years. So, um, what can be done for this? Um, osteoporosis is a non-communicable disease. It's a leading cause uh, of morbidity mortality. And uh, health policy planners need to keep prevention, diagnosis, and treatment on their priorities. 
need to keep osteoporosis on their list as well, in addition to the other very important non-communicable diseases such as obesity, diabetes. And they should make the, um, you know, accessibility, the accessibility for assessing risk, uh, risk accessible to the general population. Um, this can be done through awareness programs directed both to the public as well as healthcare professionals and uh, importance of peak bone mass that we just talked about. And patients with osteoporosis fractures, it's important to remember that, at, as I mentioned earlier, they are at risk of subsequent fracture within one year of having had that index fracture. And so this is the time in which they require a lot of support to prevent, re, to prevent refracture from occurring. And there are various fracture liaison services um, that exist elsewhere in the, um, you know, internationally, and they have been um, shown to be very effective in helping to guide the patient for, uh, through their management after hip fracture in order to prevent recurrent fractures. And they, they have been able to um, establish these in a cost-effective manner, you know, making sure they come for follow-up, you know, frequent calling, SMS messages, all these can be done cost-effectively. Now, where vitamin D deficiency in calcium is concerned, we've already alluded that lifestyle change and the food fortification policies, mandatory food fortification policies, um, you know, uh, uniform ones, not just in these major urban areas should be in place. And awareness campaigns, we've talked about underscoring the role of physical activity in achieving health and peak bone mass are mandatory. Um, training of osteoporosis, training of undergrads when they're doing their medical education, and also uh, residents when they're training through uh, you know, the various disciplines in residency, they need to be um, you know, involved in this and, and you know, remind us about the importance of osteoporosis management and preventive strategies. And now we have this COVID and opportunity for online modules. So this needs to be, this would be a good idea to include this in one of those as well. Now screening for high risk individuals, DEXA facilities need to be available cost effectively across the nation, not just in the major cities. And um, even there, there is not, you know, uh, reliability is always a, an issue. So it's only when the health policy makers are involved that can make sure that these can be instituted cost effectively. And of course, a coordinated care model for the fracture liaison services need to be instituted at the level of the Institute. So osteoporosis needs to be included in the plan for um, non-communicable diseases, the action plan for non-communicable diseases, so that a national database for fracture and to um, document incidents and prevent, you know, what preventive measures have been um, undertaken to prevent future risk can be ascertained. Now, this is one step in the right direction, the Asian fight against osteoporosis. This is a consortium that has been established. It was inaugurated in 2019. Vision, the vision was to reduce the burden of osteoporosis in the region, um, mission being to engage all stakeholders, that is the policy planners, the you know, healthcare professionals, the public, all of them, in order to help set up viable and sustainable country-specific programs for prevention and treatment of osteoporosis and fragility fractures in the Asian Pacific region. Now, this uh, was the brainchild of Dr. Mahu Chandran, who is um, based in Singapore. And Singapore is a developed nation. And there was a gap that she identified there. And from there, she decided to you know, involve all the other uh, regions who were a uh, victim of this, you know, this kind of gap for osteoporosis management and you know, uh, you know, how to see the patient through after. Um, sustaining a fragility, fractures to prevent refracture, and et cetera. The lady representing us, uh, Pakistan, in the Asian Pacific Consortium on Osteoporosis is Dr. Aisha Habib Khan, who is professor of chemical and head of section head chemical pathology at the Al Khan University. I had I've had the privilege of um, you know speaking with her recently on the on these issues, and uh, she was very very keen to collaborate with endocrinologists across the, um, across the nation in order to further this cause and uh, um, strengthen this, this cause. And um, I, I hope that next year from this platform, we can all share some success stories um, in terms of, uh, you know, this, this of osteoporosis prevention and management and come back with some robust data on this, you know, in this uh, huge public health issue. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to end my talk. I would like to thank all of you once again for hearing me through. And I would be happy to question, take questions either now or at the end of um, the session. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much, Azra. It was really amazing talk, especially your bit of information about the Asian Consortium. That's something uh, new yes. for me. Yes, yes. We'll keep you updated on that. Yeah. And 
we would love to collaborate with all regions of, of Pakistan on this. That would be really amazing. And uh, I think by the looks of it, it seems that the panelists, speakers, and the chairs, we are the only audience that we have for afternoon session. We do not do not have any other participants. So I'm not sure if uh, we should be having any questions amongst ourselves. But feel free, Azra is there. Assalamu uh, Can you hear me? Yes, Akpa, how are you? So good uh, to see I'm, you. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Azza, and it, uh, it's really a nice talk. I think Sophia, to some extent, is right because I just go through the audience, and there is there is no audience. I think only the speakers, moderators, and uh, panelists are there. But uh, I think you elaborate osteoporosis, especially osteoporosis in Pakistan. Okay, as far as uh, we are Pakistani or Hamara, to be low socioeconomic area with, uh, you know, usually intake of calcium and vitamin D is very low in pregnancies. Uh, calcium intake is negligible. People doesn't yeah. know that uh, to some extent at the time of age, you know, 20, you're, when you are teenager, your bone mass was on the highest level and it gradually comes wrong with age. Absolutely. Uh, Osteoporosis is not just, you know, for females or postmenopausal females, it's for males as well. Okay? But in males, some both dramatically, both drastically you cannot see their bone loss because uh, to some extent testosterone is there. Or like in a, a postmenopausal with loss of estrogen, progesterone, the risk of osteoporosis and bone loss is very high. That's but right. I think and it's a very good talk. Thank you so very Thank much. You. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Peak bone mass is attained at the early years, 20, 20 years. And that is, is till then that, you know, you, you should make sure that the, all the efforts, preventive efforts are instituted so that your old age can be uh, more pleasant for yourself. Yeah. Preventing. Thank you. Dr. Azra, Dr. Azra, very nice talk. Thank you. And it's very neglected uh, area of the endocrinology. We uh, often neglect the osteoporosis and do not look for the osteoporosis and do not screen for the osteoporosis. And this will be the, I think this will help other to look for the, uh, this neglected field of uh, endocrinology. Right, right. I agree. Uh, Azra, I think we have a question from Dr. Suresh Kumar. Mm -hmm. uh, he is saying that a lot of pharmaceuticals are doing BMD in camps. I mean, just like you mentioned, the heel. Heel uh, ultrasound, yes. Most of the studies were done using defining osteoporosis through heel ultrasound, which is not okay. gold standard. But, you know, this the camps, um, you know, they should not be giving diagnosis, but it provides an opportunity to, you know, give them some advice, some good, if some physician is there, some healthcare professional on lifestyle measures, preventive measures for osteoporosis. So he, his question is, how to treat osteopenia with normal vitamin D3 levels? With normal vitamin D, you, you have to see for if there are the other causes for the osteopenia. As I said, secondary causes of osteoporosis. Um, that is something that you needs to be looked at as well. And, you know, the, the slide that I mentioned in which has bone mass factors and, you know, um, other extraskeletal factors, this actually provides you, the clinical factors actually provides you with an opportunity to um, you know, either reduce the modified risk factor, somebody is smoking, you can ask them to you know, stop smoking. Smoking is an independent risk factor for osteoporosis, right? So maybe it's osteopenic is related to that. Osteopenia may be related to uh, use of steroids. Secondary causes should always be looked for. And these are causes that can be eliminated actually in an, in an individual that if this is a secondary cause for osteoporosis is responsible for osteopenia or osteoporosis. That is something that can actually be removed if you remove the focus. Right, right, Asha. So uh, I second just, question. Go on, Dr. Akiba. Uh, I just go through the studies uh, in which they said actually. Dr. FDMS, Akiba is there? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, now we can. Um, uh, ultrasound heal is, FDA has proven ultrasound heal as a screening, not for the diagnostic. So, uh, where you can, uh, you know, screen for osteoporosis, there is. Uh, very, very low uh, prevalence on ultrasound heal. Okay? Yes. The diagnostic is just for DEXA and ultrasound heal is not a diagnostic, it's just a screening. Yes, right. To diagnose, that's why I bet you that in the camps, you should not diagnose mm -hmm. osteoporosis based on the ultrasound heal. 
Okay. Uh, another quick question was from Dr. Abdullah Shamshad. He is asking regarding bisphosphonates, which one would you recommend uh, as most suitable one for Pakistani women? Any data on that? Uh, we usually give uh, alendronate because it's you know taken orally once a week, right? But if somebody is to be on it on a long term uh, basis, affordability is not an issue. Then intravenous zoledronic acid, if there are you know issues with yeah. um, tolerance, this phosphonates can really give rise to a lot of reflux esophagitis. Again, a common uh, problem not just here, but everywhere in the world. So we asked them to actually you know there are ways to avoid that by asking them to take it this phosphonate or uh, empty stomach early in the morning and keep themselves upright for at least half an hour, not to lie down after having it and to treat with a lot of water. But if still it is giving rise to that, then intravenous zoledronic acid can be given once a year at uh, you know four to five milligrams uh, intravenously, it's just given once a year. And so there are more cost-effective brands for that available as well that you can use in these patients. And it's a, um, you know, actually that, that is used quite often to manage osteoporosis. Can I um, ask a question, please? Yes. Uh, so uh, it, it's about bisphosphonates because, um, you know, I'm always mystified with um, how few treatments are there for osteoporosis, for something that is uh, affecting so many people who are living longer and longer. Uh, yeah. And, you know, when bisphosphonates came to, I remember when we used to have like um, oh, 76 days on and then a break for vitamin D and calcium. So it, it'll tell you how old I am. But, you know, I, uh, I remember that. And from that to once a yearly bisphosphonate, yes, that's progress. But the thing is, once you give somebody bisphosphonate, you're really damning them for a bit because, uh, you know, you've given them uh, something that needs a drug holiday after five years. So yeah. if uh, they're alive and, well, alive and well in five years, which most of them will be, the next thing is really difficult to determine what do we do next. So I, um, I, um, I, I feel that the choice of agents isn't much really, you know, the affordability and the choice of agents. So if you start off with an anabolic, um, like, uh, you know, PTA, yeah, mm -hmm. tripartite, uh, okay, uh, that gives you a year. And then you yeah. go on to perhaps denosumab, and then you go on to bisphosphonates. But then mm -hmm. it, it, these people are in that age group where they'll get dental work done and things like that. And, you know, everything is uh, so complex now for them, it's really. It's very so complicated. I agree. We, we don't have many good options. So I think, like you said, that, you know, we have to start off with uh, perhaps prevention, mm -hmm. a bigger yeah. bone mass. Uh, you know, uh, there are um, public health campaigns should start because there are schools that have no grounds in them for children to, you know, have. To play around sports yeah. and things like that i mean in our time there used to be like we had a hockey ground we had the football ground we had separate grounds for you know basketball and uh, volleyball and things like that but you know there are there are schools that don't have any grounds anymore yeah so a house is transformed into a school you know just to, yeah. you know with no grounds yeah. absolutely you're right and these it's a public health issue really isn't it because yeah. the drugs are um are kind of um a little um crutch really at some stage but you have to stop them Yes, that's right. And, you know, measuring uh, bisphosphonates, there's this one percent risk of osteonecrosis of the everything yeah. has to be taken into yeah. account. And uh, I agree with you, uh, Dr. Vendak, that more, you know, research at the molecular level also needs to be done. Prevention is for our kind of region. Uh, prevention is yeah. definitely better than cure in the stage. Yes. And somebody was asked in terms of prevention, Maliha, I think it was that Yes. Lifestyle measures apart from right. calcium, vitamin D, there's, you know, smoking cessation, making sure they're not using um, steroids inadvertently, including homeopathic Hakimi medication. And the physical activity that we advise for them uh, are weight bearing exercises, resistance exercises, and in elderly exercise to um, attain balance. So weight bearing exercises okay, include great. walking and um, uh, uh, jogging, uh, walking, jogging, jumping. Swimming, for, for instance, if somebody comes in, in, you know, and say can swimming also reduce the risk, actually it's not a weight bearing exercise, although it is healthy in many ways, it's an aerobic exercise, but for bone strength and muscle strength, it needs to be weight bearing resistance exercises. The usual, um, you know, is five days a week for at least half an hour a day. That's, uh, you know, what the trend is. But having said that, we've had studies in which they say that if you cannot even take that time out, even if you do it for 10 minutes, brisk walking, this is the simplest form, does not require any resources, 10 minutes of brisk walking on a daily basis, that has also been shown to reduce a lot of other non-communicable disease onset. So, you know, that can be applied as well for, um, you know, uh, osteopenia and osteoporosis. So, so we, had a, we had a session, I just have a little remark to make and then 
Maliha can can do or conclude or whatever. Uh, we had yeah. a speaker um, who was from Glasgow, and uh, he has done a lot of work on metabolic um, issues in Asians. Um, mm -hmm. He's from basically from Pakistan at origin, mm -hmm. and he says that you know the usual thirty minutes for the Caucasian translates into 45 minutes for the VO max that we achieve, like we achieve VO max uh, at a lower level. So therefore, I think for muscles to gain some strength, we need 45 minutes. So basically, mm -hmm. we are damned in so many ways, aren't we? I know, I know. But I'm just saying that, you know, if you cannot achieve that, if you say 30 yeah. minutes, 45 minutes to someone and they say, oh, my, I can't, then, you know, at least give them something that, you know, just do it regularly. Yeah. Or you can at least do 10 minutes. And if yeah. they can do 10 minutes, then of course, they can increase to 15 minutes. They'll see it's not all that difficult. Their muscle strength will start improving. Exercise tolerance rates will improve. And then you can build up from that 10 minute to the level that you just cited. Maybe Malia can push the society to, to issue a statement about this, you know, public health statement, so we can get some billboards out there. Yeah. <laughs> That's Thanks right. so much, Alfra and Dr. Tabinda. Uh, I'll pass it on to Malia so that, I mean, we can have the next session. Thank you so much. Uh, Azra, there are a few questions for you. So if you mm -hmm. don't mind kind of responding to them. Yeah. The chat box. Okay, just a minute. So you can do them on your own while, I mean, we take the next session. Okay, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sophia. It's a privilege to be on the Forum of Pakistan Endocrine Society. And this session on women's health is very important and a neglected aspect. So our next talk will be upon menopause. And we all know menopause is a condition every woman has to go through in their late 40s or early 50s. The average age in Pakistan is 49 plus minus four years of menopause. And a lot of problems, including vasomotor symptoms, psychosocial issues, sexual problems, and bone health, of course. So for this, uh, we're very lucky to have Dr. Tabinda Dugal with us, a very eminent endocrinologist, consultant endocrinologist and diabetologist. She is FRCC. She has done CCT in diabetes and endocrinology from London, India. And she's currently working in Royal Cornwall Hospital with the NHS. Uh, she has special interests in women endocrine health, gender endocrinology, opacity, and complex diabetes. So uh, kindly, uh, we, I invite you for your talk, Dr. Tanina. Thank you, Malia. I will start in a minute. I will just do slideshow uh, from the beginning. And... I think I need to escape for a sign. Okay, share screen. Okay. Uh, is my screen shared? Yes. Yes, your screen is shared. Okay, fine. Thank you. So I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead. I'll start. And um, thank you, Maria, for your very kind um, introduction. I'm sorry, we can't meet face to face this time in the PES. It's a good opportunity to catch up. Um, so um, as I said, uh, my topic today, as you said, is early and late treatment options of menopause in Pakistani women. So, you know, when I was given this topic, I agonized over it because there was very little statistics coming out of Pakistan on this because it's a sort of a taboo topic and e people... Women don't talk about it generally, whether it's East or West, they don't talk about it. So there are very few stats that, ha that are there from Pakistan. However, I've tried to incorporate those with the NICE guidance and with whatever uh, little bit of knowledge I have regarding this. So uh, pardon me if I don't address this subject fully. Uh, so um, I, um, I will um, start with uh, showing you uh, the beautiful county I live in. This is Cornwall, and this is one of the beaches about three miles away from my home. So um, they, in, in Cornwall, it's, it's called the, the Sunshine County, and it is supposed to be sunny, and it's supposed to be lovely. But even, even then, we have a lot of vitamin D deficiency, which you know we were um, referring to earlier on. So I, I've got no conflicts uh, to declare, and I uh, will start off uh, briskly by uh, d defining what is menopause and what is perimenopause. So we know that menopause is preceded by perimenopause and it um, it, it starts uh, from about the late 30s, you know, when the 500,000 over have dropped to about, very briskly dropped down to about 25,000 at age 37. And, and I think around that time, this all, everything starts to go south really. And um, it, it marks the beginning, the perimenopause marks the beginning of menopause. And it's, um, 
it's menstrual irregularity from one cycle to the next, which is seven day different. There's a seven day difference between two consecutive cycles in someone who previously had regular cycles. So it uh, continues for about a year or so, and then kind of leads to menopause, which is when there are cessation, complete cessation of periods uh, for a year. So this is the um, uh, reproductive cycle in a female. So they have the reproductive phase, then they have the menopause transition, early and late menopause, and then postmenopause, which lasts throughout their lives. Um, and um, the, um, the, um, the, uh, the hormonal hallmark, of course, is the rising SA. But of course, it wouldn't apply to someone who's already on HRT or, or, or contraceptive pill. But if somebody who's uh, unchallenged by external hormones, they would have um, high FSH and that would uh, kind of manifest in variable cycle length and then skip periods and then nothing until the person is, um, is, 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 die, is dead. So, um, and what is it about the menopause that is um, uh, so emotive and, and, and why do people not talk about it? I mean, all, all, all the women know that this is going to come and, um, and, and then what does it entail? For most women, it is cessation of periods and they don't associate it with other um, features of uh, deterioration in health or change in, in their being per se. So I think um, there needs to be awareness about that. So 80% um, of women going through menopause will experience some symptoms which can last from four up until as long as 12 years. And in some patients, it lasts throughout their lives. Their, their heart flushes never stop. So um, in the UK, the average age is about 51, but it can widely depend on their body mass, their intake of oral contraceptive pills and uh, smoking and alcohol and all those things. So anybody who has got a higher bone mass will have a body mass will have a late will have a late menopause and anybody who's been on the pill will have a later menopause as well. So um, I'm not going to talk about premature menopause because it, it's a totally different subject and topic and it will take a lot of time. So I just mentioned that uh, it's about one in 100 women, which is very you know, it's the it's one percent of women will be affected by premature menopause as well, which is defined as menopause occurring before the age of forty. So in Pakistan, um, as expected, the menopause was at a younger age, so it was happening at the age of forty-five, and the main symptoms were flushing and lack of sleep and surprise, surprise, lack of fertility. So I um I uh. It, this wasn't happening in the Western population. So I don't, it, it kind of reflects that people probably start, uh, there's a portion of population that starts having kids later on in their <coughs> life and then they fear about, they, they have a fear about infertility. Other symptoms were of course urine incontinence and then 16%, uh, which is sizable proportion of people were having marital problems, probably because of vaginal dryness and painful intercourse. So basically these are all very valid issues and uh, really we need to raise uh, the awareness for that. So. Um, you know, it is it is something which all women will come to, and it's like a midlife crisis happens for men. So this is kind of a midlife crisis for women, and they there should be a clear message to the women that they should talk about uh, their menopause to their clinician, and if they have any symptoms that that are treatable and their lifestyle to be modified, they need to do that, and they need to uh, discuss the options that can be used to help them. So uh, the conversation with the patient could happen at any time, but because we don't have a, uh, a structured system of general practice, um, we, uh, you know, I know that um, the Pakistan Endocrine Society does uh, a general GP um, education uh, sessions. So I think we can raise their awareness about this and they can have conversation with their patients if uh, the patients are around that age, the 45 to 55 bracket. So it can start at the time or if the patient voluntarily seeks they can start um, seeking um, a consultation at the, at the time of perimenopause where, you know, their personal and family history like of breast, endometrial cancer, cervical cancer can be discussed in with a view to pro providing um, future uh, hormone replacement therapy. Um, or uh, also a discussion about their physical activity and BMI, uh, which is modifiable risk factors um, for um, perhaps uh, risk factors that will be further complicated by menopause. And of course, um, if somebody is in the perimenopause and uh, they would still be deemed to be uh, fertile, they would need contraception uh, to cover themselves for two years um, after their last menstrual period. Uh, they will also need, uh, obviously, uh, if they're postmenopausal, they will need uh, management of menopausal symptoms or vulvovaginal atrophy, sexual dysfunction and osteoporosis prevention. 
So um, uh, consideration uh, for all women at menopause is uh, stressing the lifestyle and, and, you know, encouraging them to be more active, taking good nutrition, um, cessation of smoking, limiting alcohol, not, not particularly applicable, but uh, it has to be said. Um, and, 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 you know, it, it will benefit all women um, in there. Um, so all women should be reviewed with their cardiovascular risk factor, uh, family history of cardiovascular heart disease, blood pressure, lipids, uh, should be screened for diabetes. They should have a fasting blood glucose level. They um, should be asked about their urogenital health if there's any um, urgency or frequency um, or leaking um, and, uh, and, and sending them for cancer screening. So breast check or a cervical uh, check. So uh, the breast screening starts here at the age of 50 and it goes on uh, till the age of about 75. So every three years. Um, with uh, the cervical screening, uh, that uh, that also uh, starts um, uh, earlier, and in the younger person, um, until the age of fifty, it's every year, and after that, it's five yearly up until the age of sixty-five. So there is a um, there's a robust national program for all these screenings uh, here, which is mandatory, and it runs through the GPs. Uh, so the symptoms uh, that the patient may have, um, and they are driven obviously by estrogen lack, uh, dry eyes, um, irregular bleeding, um, uh, reduced libido, hot flushes, uh, changes in the mood, uh, urinary in in incontinence, uh, frequency and sleep disorders, fatigue, joint pains and uh, low mood, etc. So a general advice for symptom management is asking them to uh, keep themselves cool and have uh, layers on which they can peel off uh, so that if they need to cool themselves down quickly, they can. Uh, the, 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 the effects of, of exercise on vasomotor symptoms is obviously it will increase their flushing and sweating, but of course it will improve their sleep and general well-being. So they should be encouraged to uh, exercise. So um, it, this is all related, obviously, to the estrogen levels, which um, your uh, the the ovaries pack up with time, and uh, because as they run out of eggs, there is nothing uh, for them to produce, like in the way of the normal cycle. So the estrogen, which is uh, the person is brimming with estrogen in their thirties, um, it starts to go down and down and down till it's literally in their boots uh, at age eighty. So there's virtually no estrogen left in somebody who's eighty years old. Uh, and this all drives a, a lack of estrogen uh, and in, insufficiency uh, symptoms, which are um, in this cartoon, uh, you know, loose, loose teeth, headache, uh, hot flushes, hearing problems, fatty liver, arthritis, uh, laying of fat around the abdomen. Uh, skin gets wrinkly, uh, they get stress or urge incontinence, they have changes in their breasts, and they become more droopy, etc. So a lot of things to worry about, including their personal appearance. And uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, it, this has been talked about a lot, so I will try and be brief and skip through it. Uh, but, you know, the, 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 I think where it will affect most would be lack of a loss of height and uh, lack of uh, bone mineralization and, and bone density loss. And, uh, you know, I, I think that this has been talked about, you know, people achieve their peak bone mass in their mid thirties. Um, and there is um, then a rapid loss after menopause. The pink line is a female and the blue line is a male. So you can see that uh, although males do decline, they decline much slowly in comparison with females. So around that time um, at about age 50 plus, uh, there's a very rapid decline in the in the bone mass. And, and therefore if, um, someone has estrogen deficiency, which is what is triggering uh, this. Uh, th this is a study from Pakistan, which shows um, uh, the osteoporosis uh, prevalence in Pakistan. And um, this was a small um, cohort of patients. They were about uh, 138 patients, out of which 110 were male and 128 were females. And you can see that um, most of the patients were the, between the ages 35 and 45. Um, there were a few that were going up to the age of 75, but the but 26% uh, of females had osteoporosis and 66% had osteopenia. 43% males had osteopenia and 13% males had osteoporosis. So there's a sizable, so one in four women in this had osteoporosis and even more than one in two uh, women had osteopenia. So this is a, a huge, uh, huge problem. And uh, with advancing um, or increasing longevity, this is going to become even more of an issue uh, with uh, no quality uh, left in, in, in life. Uh, and the burden of osteoporosis worldwide is, is huge as well. Um, we know that 68% uh, osteoporotic fractures 
then there is stroke 10%, but in comparison with heart attacks and everything put together is, is less than osteoporotic fracture. So breast cancer, stroke and heart attack, everything put together is less than osteoporotic fracture. So this is a huge problem. So anyhow, I'll, I'll, I'll move uh, quickly to the next thing, which is obviously related to um, HRT and its side effects and the concerns that people raise every time um, hormone, um, menopausal hormone therapy is initiated. So. Uh, there's lack of randomized control trials and there's a lot of observational estimates and which is what this slide show, shows you that the, the randomized control estimate was that while someone was a current HRT user, they had less heart attacks and less ischemic heart disease. And uh, if they had less than five years duration, they still had less of heart disease. However, the observational estimate uh, showed that there were 16 fewer, but all of them showed that there were fewer people having uh, heart attacks if they had had um, Eastern-based uh, HRT. So um, it, it's a good call to do it. Uh, however, the main concern obviously remains uh, the, the connection with breast cancer. Uh, there was a big meta-analysis in 2019 and there were a lot of alarm bells as a result of that meta-analysis that all forms of HRT, no matter what they were, increased breast cancer risk with use of more than even a year. So they said the cumulative risk persisted for more than 10 years and it was combination uh, therapy that was increasing it more and in comparison with just estrogen only. So uh, it, it didn't have any relation with local estrogen use like for um, a vaginal atrophy uh, use of lo local estrogen didn't increase uh, the breast cancer risk. So there was another meta-analysis that has just come around at the end of October. And although the meta-analysis started uh, around the same time as the 2019 meta-analysis, it seems to be better structured and the questionnaires are better. And rather than relying on the patient's memory, they've, they've managed to take uh, more specific outcomes from this. So this shows, although the risk is, is there, but it isn't as much as the previous meta-analysis showed. So the odds ratio is 1.2, uh, which actually means eight extra cases per 10,000 people, uh, women of that age. And it doesn't persist beyond five years of HRT use. If, if somebody has stopped taking HRT, it, uh, the risk goes down after five years. So uh, some good news there. Uh, there's also the concern about venous thromboembolism. So there is some data there that women in their 50s were not taking HRT, still have venous thromboembolic uh, risk, which is four to seven per thousand. But women who take HRT, it goes up to nine to 12. Mm -hmm. uh, they, with use of tibolone, which is one form of HRT, there isn't any increased risk. So this is one of the, uh, one of the places where you can use tibolone if somebody's had a VT before. Mm -hmm. uh, tibolone, I'll, I'll give it a special mention because it's relatively um, uh, less known and people don't know much about it. So it's first line treatment for menopausal symptoms. It's, uh, it, it breaks down into estrogen progesterone, uh, but it's not, uh, um, it, it's a pro form of, the, of those. Uh, the balance and benefits risk of tibolone uh, have been assessed um, with a randomized trial, which is one of the few drugs that have been trialed. So the trial was called LIFT trial. So in women above 60, it was giving them increased risk of stroke. So 2.2 uh, versus 2.2 um, times more likely to have a stroke in older women. In younger women, it wasn't increasing their risk. So in younger women, um, it, it was similar to the convention com com combined hormone therapy, but the LIFT study, as I said, was 2.2 times more uh, the risk uh, the risk of stroke. There was also risk of endometrial cancer, uh, but uh, they again conflicting uh, reports from the general practice research database. It didn't show any significant increase in risk of any of these. So again, it's it's really difficult to judge. Um, so I think it has to be all based on the patient's risk and benefit. So we can also ask patients to take alternatives, which are diet dietary supplements like black cohosh and isoflavins that can reduce their hot flushes and night sweats. And uh, we, we need to tell the patient that the ingredients of these products may vary because they are not controlled like uh, pharmaceutical drugs. And it may interfere with some of the drugs that they're taking, especially tamoxifen they interfere with. So anybody who's taking tamoxifen after breast cancer shouldn't be asked to take this or should be discouraged from taking these. Also, there was a very new study that came around, came out in September. It was published online in September, which is uh, murine, but it shows that if patients take, uh, if, if, they, if uh, they were given a diet rich in glucosinates, uh, phytosterols and citrus flavonoids, uh, it reduced their weight gain around the mid, mid, uh, middle and also improved their lipid profile. So there is, uh, I think, some um, areas of dietary modification that we can offer our patients. 
So um, I'll jump quickly on to what uh, preparations of estrogen are there. Um, there are oral estrogen preparations, which are obviously convenient and patients can remember to take it every day, but they do have uh, increased risk of venous thromboembolism. They also uh, bind with, uh, they uh, reduce the free testosterone by increasing the sex hormone binding globulin. They also uh, increase the TBG and the patient may need to take more thyroid hormone. So uh, there are transdermal preparations as well. And the advantages are that they don't have to go through the first pass and therefore they don't have to go through the liver. There is no VTE and there's a cumulative lower dose that is given with them. Uh, and there's convenience for some women because it's used maybe once or twice a week. Uh, however, uh, some people may forget to use it twice a week in, in comparison with once a day tablet. So, um, and, and some people may get local reactions and they might find it sticky or they might drop with sweat and all that. And, and sometimes people may uh, have hairy skin and may get poorly absorbed, uh, but most of the times uh, women get on pretty well with this. And of course, anybody who has a uterus has to be covered with progesterone in the, in the presence of estrogen. And so synthetic progesterone are called progestins and they're taken orally, uh, either in, um, in a combined uh, with uh, estrogen or in a separate tablet uh, or in a patch with the estradiol progestin patch. So, uh, you know, people think that micronized progesterone is very biosimilar to the natural progesterone that women produce. So they will say that perhaps that is less uh, harmful and, and, and perhaps that should be more prescribed more than um, the progesterone. So mm -hmm. it can be taken orally or, um, or uh, in an in intravaginal pessary as well. Mm -hmm. And then there's levonorgestrel intrauterine device, uh, which uh, can be left there for five years as well as a progesterone uh, treatment therapy. Mm -hmm. Surveillance of menopausal hormone therapy, all, all women uh, taking that should have a six monthly review and then they should have biannual, at least biannual mammography. And if they complain of any abnormal vaginal discharge, blood stain discharge, they should have ultrasound and or, and or endometrial uh, biopsy. So uh, also some uh, new drugs on, uh, which are TSEC therapy, which is an estrogen receptor modul modulator, which is CERM, which is um, basidoxyphen, uh, which blocks it on the receptors. But we also can give the equine estrogen, which is the CEE, the conjugated um, estrogen, 0.45 milligram daily. And this isn't, uh, so far, it hasn't been associated with um, effects that the other um, menopausal hormone therapies have been associated with. Although um, the um, incidence of VTE needs to be clarified further. So uh, the, the, the um, treatments uh, will depend on what st stage of menopause transition the person is. In the perimenopause, they can have sequential estrogen with um, uh, with progesterone, uh, and or they can have combined oral contraceptive pill. They can have estrogen plus uh, the implant, uh, progesterone implant. Uh, Postmenopausally, with intact uterus, they can have a combined transdermal patch or transdermal estrogen plus oral progesterone, or they can have an intrauterine progesterone device, or uh, they can have tibolone, or they can have TSEC. If uh, they have no uterus, so their post things are easy. You, they can just have transdermal estrogen or oral estrogen or tibolone. So the dosing uh, and route of estrogen, uh, the um, CEE, uh, which is the equine estro uh, estrogen, is oral. 17-beta uh, estradiol is also oral. Uh, estradiol varilate is also oral. The transdermal estradiol patch is obviously transdermal, and then there is the gel. So the doses they can be, they have to be started on a low dose in someone who has uh, been um, uh, has had a last period many years ago. But if somebody has just finished the menopause, they may tolerate the higher dose, so they can be started on the moderate dose. So basically, the benefit has been shown that they um, that the menopausal hormonal therapy, if started within the first ten years, would have minimum side effects and maximum benefit to the patient. So it has to be done at the right time mm -hmm. and with the right dose. So if somebody has not had periods for a long time, they should be given smaller dose of estrogen, and then the dose can be built upon. And mm -hmm. And whatever route they prefer and whatever is suitable uh, suited to the patient. Um, so the, uh, as I said, younger women may need higher doses because they have been used to higher estrogen doses. And, um, and, and low doses sometimes do not alleviate the vaginal dryness uh, and they may need extra vaginal estrogen uh, to uh, alleviate that. The uh, dosing uh, with progesterone uh, orally, uh, uh, there are dihydro, um, uh, sorry, didrogesterone, 
which is supposed to be the safest. Um, but unfortunately, it's uh, not available separately. It is in combined form, but you can't prescribe it separately. It's not available in the UK. And then there is a MPA, which is medoxyprogesterone, which is traditional and has been there for quite some time. Then there's norethisterone, which is in most of the transdermal patches. And then there's micronized progesterone, which is again, as I said previously, supposed to be the safest. So different progesterone group has different uh, side effect profiles. And I think it should be discussed with the patient. Most common uh, commercial preparations have either MPA, which is medoxyprogesterone, NETA, which is norethisterone, or norgestrel. So if there's a problem with one combination, you can change to another with a different progesterone, or you can split the estrogen and the progesterone pill separately so that you can uh, upregulate or downregulate the dose. Uh, or if the person is having a lot of symptoms, you can reduce the progesterone from 14 days, which is given uh, estrogen uh, 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 throughout the cycle and progesterone first 14 days, you can reduce that to 10 days. Micro, uh, micronized progesterone, as I said, is bioidentical, but, um, in, in, but, but we need to use the regulated products only. Uh, so um, the continuous progesterone, so we can use cyclical, the previous one was cyclical progesterone, we can also use continuous progesterone, again, same preparation, ex uh, except we have um, dros drosperinone as well, which is just oral preparation, it is not transdermal. And again, we have got all the choices that we previously had. Uh, so these are the continuous progesterone is recommended for women over 54. It allows lower dose, less side effects and less fluctuation in progesterone levels. And the availability of the preparations will vary from country to country. I'm not sure what is available in Pakistan. So uh, combinations, uh, I think we use combinations if somebody doesn't uh, does have a uterus. So transdermal uh, estrogen gel has flexible dosing options, but needs to be used with oral or intrauterine uh, progesterone. Transdermal um, estrogen plus uh, didrogesterone or micronized, uh, micronized progesterone may be associated with less pro pro uh, progesteronic uh, side effects and less risk of breast cancer. So perhaps this is the ideal combination if the patient tolerates it or can afford it. Transdermal or oral estradiol plus um, uh, levonorgestrel intrauterine device is um, no bleed and therefore of benefit to the patient and uh, there is less breast density when patients are taking oral norethisterone. Then again, we have got Tibolone and we have TSEC as well to use in combinations. Tips uh, for um, physicians treating uh, these uh, are that if symptoms persist on high dose oral therapy, uh, there's no point in increasing the dose if SHBG is high. So measure the SHBG, measure the estradiol levels and change the uh, administration route. So if the patient is having oral uh, estrogen and uh, still having symptoms, just measure their levels and change them to perhaps uh, non-oral, which is the transdermal form, either gel or uh, a patch. If symptoms are there on high dose, um, Non-oral therapy, check uh, serum estradiol. As I said, we need to check estrogen if, if there are uh, good levels of estrogen. Uh, there is um, a controversy about uh, whether uh, it gets rid of depression or low mood that comes with menopause, but there is some evidence that it does improve the mood and sleep quality. So lots of uh, benefits as well. So people who have uh, breast cancer survivors and uh, have got menopause surgically induced or for some other reason um, through tablet induction, do not give them HRT uh, estrogen uh, progesterone combination uh, unless they are extremely symptomatic, then they can have a short course um, and uh, they need have to have a discussion about the associated risks. Um, so uh, for these women, we can use SSRIs, um, but if they're taking tamoxifen, we can't use that as well. Uh, we shouldn't be offering them soy isoflavins or um, black cohosh or red clover or vitamin D or magnetic devices to treat menopausal symptoms. We can offer them clonidine for the vasomotor symptoms. So we should do a review at six to eight um, uh, weeks, uh, side effects and symptom relief discussion with the patient. They should be given a point of contact next review in six months and another review in 12 months. And we can do virtual consultation as we know, unless the patient has got bleeding or and they need an ultrasound or internal examination. So uh, that's all I've had to say. And uh, I will uh, just leave it uh, this way. Of, it's, it's just for all of us 50 is the new 18. So I think, uh, Let's think that we're going to be 18 all over again soon. And uh, if, if we've already passed that, we are in our 20s or whatever. But uh, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take those. Thank you very much, Dr. Tavinda. A very nice, excellent presentation. And the treatment options very much needed because we do come across a lot of patients with these issues. And unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, we don't have the transdermal patches or the gels available in Pakistan, oh. which is the best treatment option, as you said. 
and i loved your last night so i would invite the panelists for their comments and discussion Yeah, Samikam, Dr. Tabinda, Dr. Asma. So yeah, I agree. This is a very important topic, and you know, in Pakistan, especially because of the low literacy rate, and most women don't know how to deal with symptoms. And you know, the problem is that this lack of awareness it breeds more myths about the menopause. So this is a very important issue, you know, that how to tackle with the myths. So because in UK, you also you know kind of uh, deal with a lot of women who come from you know who are from Pakistan. So how do you deal with those myths? so um you know they um in my area I, uh, fortunately unfortunately there aren't any pakistanis uh, it's like 99% white population but they um the pakistani population is mostly um you know quite amenable to suggestions if 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 you give them any suggestions they will be amenable however there are different um racial groups so whatever you expect from how the um pharmacokinetics in a white person are it'll be totally different in them and uh, i think you have to go very slowly because they lose their confidence very quickly so i think you kind of uh, do small increments and you discuss the options with them a lot of them will say we don't want it because we uh, because if they're perimenopausal and they're still having their periods uh, they will say oh we we just we waiting for our periods to go away and we want to say our namaz and all that and we don't want any more periods and things like that so you know it, it's period free and and then they have got a lot of issues around uh, things that would cause contraception like an intrauterine device they sometimes don't go for a myrena uh, and things like that but um a lot of time they they will be guided by what you want to do really they they are okay mostly but they are they are dark and they are vitamin d deficient and they don't do exercise and a lot of them have got uh you know issues with um perhaps um you know um lactose intolerance because a lot of asians do have lactose intolerance and there isn't enough milk absorption and things like that so they do have that issue that uh, they they have got um although they appear uh, to be healthy bmi but they're not actually healthy people yeah because in terms of vitamin d deficiency another thing which i have noticed you know recently that uh, a lot of patients who have polycystic ovarian syndrome they are coming to us and saying you know that you should avoid dairy products so you know a lot of women have stopped taking dairy products and then you have to keep on you know focusing on their vitamin d and it's very important you know from all the aspects that we are talking about women health today uh so this is something which is really new and you know uh, a lot of women with psos they have stopped taking dairy products which is very well it it's 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 amazing really i mean i was um it's a uh, uh, there's a lot of expectation there's a patient expectation that the doctor has to manage because it's a lot of private care and i think that uh the doctors kind of kind of have to listen to the patient and and they want quick results and things like that so they will say and do things that the patient sometimes doesn't want to hear and then the patient forgets those things so i think the doctors are giving good advice but the patient don't want to do anything that they you know that they they're just not they, i mean having said that the darker skins have got issues with vitamin d absorption and you know people don't go outside they're not going outside for security reasons for uh, social reasons for religious reasons women are not getting enough sun anyway but, so i think uh, there there has to be a campaign of vitamin d um, supplementation although it may not be diet fortified because you know i i i think we are miles away from dietary fortification here but at least people can take themselves but then there's the other extreme people who are going toxic on vitamin d as well i heard about a few people who have taken too much vitamin d as well and they're like uh, you know um uh, have vitamin d toxicity so it's 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 very difficult i think it's 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 really difficult and i think it's a it's a, it's a difficult challenge really that doctors in pakistan do face <clears throat> tagna very nice presentation uh, i just want to you know add something Uh, if we talk about Pakistan, okay, there is something uh, the patient acceptance is there regarding menopause. I think it's happening; it will happen. Yeah. And we don't know, uh, want to treat it. And the other hand, on the other hand, uh, as a physician, we are also reluctant to start with HRT and uh, table <coughs> one and something like that, because people think it's a natural phenomena. Obviously, it's a natural phenomena. But where they, uh, you know, where your basic necessities is, you know, uh, is a main issue. Yeah. Uh, the hrt to deal with hrt and then to monitor it i think uh, this is uh, the main thing and uh, from physician point of view 
uh, from endocrinologist, endocrinologist point of view, I think we usually, uh, if the patient is not, you know, discussing with us, so we on the other hand are also not discussing regarding menopause. Yeah, we are dealing with diabetic patient, we are dealing with hypothyroidism, hypothyroidism, but um, most of them are menopause as well. We are, but we are not, you know, do any discussion and we are not offering them for menopause as yeah. well. So I think they, this is our main thing, like uh, there is a reluctancy as well from the physician side. That is true, but I think there must be a proportion of women who are um, career oriented. They're they're educated and they're in careers, and they are really troubled by hot flushes because exactly. they're in like uh, corporate meetings exactly. and things like that. I mean, they mm -hmm. must be coming over and seeking, uh, you know, uh, some kind of uh, help. Yeah. Uh, and um, mm -hmm. I think that um, perhaps we need to have some leaflets about it. And, uh, you know, let the patient make the choice and say yes or no. But at least we we would have a relief of our conscious that we have discussed this with the patient. We've given them the pros and cons. We've given them the leaflet. They can go exactly. through the leaflet and let us know if they want to do anything. So I think perhaps uh, a, a leaflet is, um, is, is what we need and we can give it to patients. And I think what perhaps perhaps maybe there's, a, 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 you know, a, an acceptance of menopause, but what about premature menopause? I don't think anybody talks about that. You know, that is a huge, huge thing, really, because um, I, I, I don't have the stats uh, for Pakistan, but here, uh, every gynae endo clinic, uh, we, uh, we have about 12 patients in each clinic. So at least two to three are premature menopause. Some as young as 18, some as um, old as 40. But, you know, they need to continue to have hormone replacement till they reach the natural age of menopause. So. You know, um, I think that I can see your point where you're saying that when people hit the menopause, say maybe mid 50s, when the life expectancy is 67, they're not that bothered if they uh, lose height and things like that. Uh, but perhaps, uh, you know, there are there are some people who live longer than that or who plan to live longer than that or who are very healthy and don't have any heart disease or, or diabetes. Perhaps that's that's an option for them. Uh, there is a yeah, and and yeah, there's a there's a couple of questions. I don't know if uh, I, I should answer them here or. So it's um, uh, how, how to manage females who've had surgery like salpingo-ophorectomy for other reasons in their 30s. What are the options for them? Well, if they've had uh, salpingo-ophorectomy, um, then um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that they've had hysterectomy as well or, or they haven't had hysterectomy. So basically what you're saying is that um, you wait for um, either uh, them coming back with flushes and things like that because obviously they will get a, a, a symptoms or you discuss it with them if they're young and you have to start replacement as is because this is how their body was going to get. So they won't get the side effects that people would get uh, with, um, so it's, for them, it's not HRT. It's like you can give them OCP or things that are more perhaps suitable to that age group and more uh, acceptable to that age group. So because they'll get enough um, uh, estrogen from uh, COCP rather than getting it from menopausal hormone therapy, because in those estrogen progesterone levels are quite low. So perhaps if they have an intact uterus, uh, they need to be given, um, you know, a combination of uh, estrogen and progesterone the same one as in combined oral contraceptive pill. But if they don't have a uterus, then the estrogen on its own would be enough. Uh, so I think they should be offered full replacement as, as somebody of their age would have. Um, their tubal ligation, I think people undergo early men menopause if they have tubal ligation. They, they tend to undergo earlier men menopause at least five or five or seven years earlier than their, um, um, say, perhaps age, ma age matched. Um, and there's another question, how to manage severe depression and mood changes in females after menopause, uh, apart from vitamin D, CBT, SSRIs, thyroid. Uh, yes, all of them. CBT you can do, SSRIs you can do, and hormone replacement apparently lifts your mood. Because I think that if your joints are not hurting, if you sleep well, if you're not flushing at, 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 the, at the flick of a button and uh, you are um, able to... Um, um, you know, um, carry on your life as you did before close to that, I think there would be less depression. Um, and uh, yes, all of them, CBT as well as, as everything. SSRI as well, yeah. Um, There's yeah. another question, Dr. Tavinda. Um, uh, women who desire to improve their sexual health uh, regarding issues such as vaginal dryness and dyspareunia in the immediate postmenopausal uh, period, uh, what's the best treatment option you would offer? So, um, so if they're immediately postmenopausal, uh, we can discuss with them what do they want. Do they want to be uh, stuck with like a, a regular, um, you know, 
patch or tablet daily, or do they want local treatment? Because local treatment doesn't in, uh, increase your risk or anything. So if they are, um, it, it, it should there should have be a full discussion with them about systemic estrogen th uh, therapy benefits and the lo local benefits. So they can have both actually. And things like evening primrose oil work quite well with people. I think they also regulate the secretion. They would reduce that as well. And um, uh, local uh, estrogens and also um, uh, they can have, um, you know, parenteral, um, uh, sorry, oral, uh, oral estrogen and uh, progesterone therapy if they wish to have that. Plus, I think that I didn't touch upon that because I thought uh, that perhaps people don't talk about it over here. There's lack of libido and um, there's one indication of testosterone therapy in women, which becomes part of HRT, uh, postmenopausal HRT, is that if there's lack of libido, you can actually give testosterone. So there's a preparation in um, Australia that is licensed for, uh, or oh, that is available, not licensed, but available for women because it's a lower dose. So women produce one tenth of uh, the um, amount that men do. Uh, so it's about five milligrams of testosterone. So you can actually replace with five milligrams of testosterone, whichever way you want. So we don't have that preparation. So what we do is, uh, you know, we have these little uh, tubes, toothpaste like tubes of testo gel. So we've been taking them out with a two mil syringe and, and asking the patient to just draw it out and they can use it on multiple days and then rub it on. So it has really worked wonders for their libido. So perhaps this might lift their mood as well. So sometimes the underlying depression is from, you know, lack of a relationship and or the husband, um, you know, uh, giving stink to the wife on, on this. Uh, so I think this should be talked about because people don't talk about over here. People don't talk about it either because it is so on a totally uh, different uh, topic. Like if you ask um, men, men, hypogonadal men come uh, to you and you ask them, uh, uh, you know, what about your, uh, you know, sex, sex life? And they will say, oh, I didn't think it was important because I'm 50 something now or I'm 40 something now. I've had my children. They'll say, oh, I've had my children. So I don't feel it's good. So I think you have to really tease it out with, with people and, and ask them. So I, I don't know how people feel about this over here. I don't know. I mean, what is the general perception of endocrinologists about this? Do you ask the patients? Yes, uh, we have the educated class as well. There are different sets of patients. Like in the government sector, I work in Lahore General Hospital. Hardly any patient talks about it, but I practice in DHA Lahore. So here I do have patients, okay. and uh, both males and females, and okay. male, females especially immediately postmenopausal. And this is a right. big concern, vaginal dryness yeah. and dyspareunia. So as you say, local preparation seems to be the best. I, what yeah, I they, they, from you. yeah, they they do indeed. I mean, you can try pessaries or there are, um, pessaries are perhaps the best because they, 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 they stay there and they lubricate and all that. And then there are gel preparations that you draw out in a little syringe and, and, and you can inject them uh, uh, like um, locally. Uh, so several preparations there. But I think local ones perhaps would be more... Um, and then they, it reduces the risk of UTI as well. Not only does it reduce the dyspareunia, it also, um, you know, kind of gives them less um, because uh, there's plumping of the um, of the um, of their vagina and therefore less um, transmission of infection. So there, it, it does um, it does help with that as well. So uh, these are basically estrogen preparations or estrogen progesterone. No, they're just estrogen preparations. Zero point one percent. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much. Okay. 0.01%. Uh, 0.01%. Yeah. Do you not have any in Pakistan? No, I'm not aware of it. We couldn't so what do you use in them then? What are you using? We have to give oral preparations oh. in a low dose okay. because we don't have the gel. Okay. Recently, Testo gel was uh, launched in Karachi. Also in Lahore, but not yet available. It's in okay. the launching phase. But you, the, the thing is, if somebody has dyspareunia, and even though their libido is good, it's not going to work, is it? Yes, so that's have, the problem. Yeah, you have, have to get to rid of their dyspareunia. Yeah, you have to get rid of their okay. dyspareunia first. Yeah, but you know what is uh, what is really um, remarkable, and I will. Um, I will say this because we don't know. I, I think there's nobody listening to this, but you know, it's lamentable that 51% of the population. A, nobody has an interest in their endocrine problems. It, it just says everything about it, doesn't it? Yes, exactly. But uh, that's why we're working on it. Yeah, we should. <laughs> we should. Yeah, well done you. Well done all of you. Well done all of you. It's not yeah. easy. I know it's not easy to work in Pakistan because, you know, the, the clients are difficult and it's... Um, they're like half educated on Google and then things are not available and you have to spend yeah. long time and 
you know, it's uh, they they are paying for the time, and it's just a nightmare. Really, it is a nightmare. So I yeah, might... there are few patients who can get their preparations from abroad, okay. but that's a very small set. Small. That's just yeah. let let's say one person. So, so I, think, uh, I think what about you know there should be a drive to import these things on named patient basis so even though if they're not available generally I, I think we should be allowed to um, like say uh, we have uh, got um, I do the pediatric um, clinic we ad adolescent clinic so there are some uh, uh, boys with um, small penises so for them there's a DHT preparation uh, that is not available in the UK. So uh, we only get it in, from France. So we get it on name pa patient basis from France and it has such good results like, you know, within six months they may add on two centimeters or something like that to their penis. And it, it's like, yeah, That's it's really good. So I, I think you should be able to get it on name patient basis really. I mean, it, it's not even available in India, no? All right. So that's a great idea, but we need some legislation. Yes, work should be done in this aspect for the patients who need yeah, it. Like yeah. we can write the prescription and get it from anywhere. I think perhaps some from UK, some from Dubai, Canada, or wherever it is available. Patients who can pay and we need to legislate this problem. We uh, need to. Issue. I think um, uh, let's talk with uh, Professor Tasneem about this. Yes, uh, she'll be very helpful. I'm sure. I, so what are the, the rest... brand conjugated estrogen uh, vaginal creams? Uh, Premarin, um, yeah, uh, there are several brands. There are actually several brands. Um, I can find out about them, but there are several brands. Several brands. No role of um, magnesium in osteoporosis. No, I, that's not for me. All right, then I think uh, we've just uh, coming. To actually, that I was answering a question in the chat box. This is Dr. Azra. Uh, Dr. Tabinda, I just want to ask you people in the uh, perimenopausal um, you know, uh, area and they're having hot flashes, for instance, and still, you know, menstrual, menstrual cycles are still occurring. Yeah. Yeah. Do, you, um, do you advise them? I, I may have addressed that in the presentation. I'm sorry, I uh, may have missed yeah. that. Do you advise them hormone therapy at that stage? Yeah, you can. So basically what you do is uh, you, uh, from the, they start their HRT from first day of the cycle. Because if you don't do that, if you start it randomly, they're going to have irregular bleeding, which they won't thank you for. So it, there isn't enough estrogen to override their, um, you know, um, uh, their native in, uh, estrogen, if, if, if that makes sense. So uh, basically, you start it off. Uh, it won't suppress their endogenous, but it will definitely give them relief. So basically, you start off from day one of the cycle and you do uh, you can you can give them HRT. So um, first 12 days of uh, progesterone, estrogen combined and then um, then estrogen alone. So they should get relief from that. Right. That's How about the low dose uh, OCPs? Can they be given yeah, like yeah, 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 yes. yeah, 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 because they won't suppress their cycles, but they will definitely yeah. they won't have a contraceptive effect. That is, but they, they will they will not give them irregular bleeding if started at the right time, if that makes sense. Right. Thank you so very much. Okay. Rest of our panelists, uh, I hope they're here. Dr. Saira Furkan, uh, can you hear us? You can hear Dr. Dr. Tabinda, it's Dr. Naeem. It's, it was an excellent and comprehensive presentation. Thank you very much. I have just two queries. Uh, whether there is any role of gabapentines, which we have read in the books, uh, we usually prescri prescribe in our patients? along with the SSRI and it produces some effects. What about your experience on the gabapentines or pregabalins? It does. Uh, it does. But but nothing works like HRT. So, uh, you know, if somebody doesn't want to take HRT, um, I, uh, they've, uh, they've, I've, I've had people who have been through, uh, like we start off with, we used to give adultism, we used to give gabapentin, venlafaxin, we would, oh, but, uh, you know, they're licensed, venlafaxin is licensed for, uh, you know, for all this, but, you know, eventually clonidine as well, um, and, and sometimes they kind of settle on clonidine, uh, but I, I didn't find gabapentin very effective, and, and, you know, it has got its own side effects as well, you know, they put on weight, and they get dizzy, and, and all that, so I think the doses needed to suppress all this are perhaps quite high. Thank you very much. And my other question is that you are suggesting that use of testosterone in uh, females for the increase of libido. Uh, do you recommend no, it's any? Not, it's not increase of libido. It's someone who is complaining of no libido. So you yes. don't use it like an aphrodisiac. You use it to treat uh, something that you should naturally be doing, like normally be doing. So uh, it's just, just to correct you, because I think it's not like... Um, 
it's not like the writings, the chalking on the wall, you know, uh, like the Hakims do that, you know, will will increase your potency and things. It's not like that. It's just because the testosterone, the receptors in the brain uh, would help do that. Uh, you know, it would give you perhaps more desire uh, to be with your partner. And um, if, if that is completely gone, routinely, there is no role for that. And routinely, there is no role for DHEAS either. So, you know, it's, um, it's, it's perhaps more, uh, it, I, I've seen it uh, perhaps more evident in people who were Sheehan syndrome uh, or uh, perhaps they had Edison's and things like that. And it was more prominent in them. Um, and, and people with normal um, uh, menopause perhaps had it so slowly that they perhaps adapted to it. Uh, some people do complain, but because it happens very gradually, you see the the hormones just, it doesn't happen one day to the next. So the hormone gradually pack up and the body gets used to it. So there are a few people who had certain conditions, but there are some menopausal people as well who can't tolerate a lot of HRTs and then they complain about this lack of libido. It just works wonders, actually. I must uh, tell you my own experience, it works wonders. Um, I have about uh, four patients on this and... It, it really worked well with them. Okay, so uh, Dr. Saira Farkan here. Dr. Tabinda, for this decreased libido, in which dose you prescribe this testo for females? So it's a five milligrams a day. What you can do is you start off with even lower dose. So you can start off with 2.5 and you obviously have to warn them about, you know, increased hair and things like that. Uh, but um, they, um, you and, you know, check that persons. You start off with 2.5 uh, milligrams and then uh, you can go up to five because that's their uh, normal requirement is five. So you check their uh, testosterone levels beforehand and you will find them low anyway. And then you supplement them, start off low and then build it up and they will tell you partial response. And then you can go on to full dose if they haven't had the desired response. Uh, Dr. Tabinda, I have a question uh, a bit off this topic. There are some news that DHEAS uh, preparations are being used as anti-aging of labor. Is this true? Mm, uh, uh, you know, there are very small trials about it in patients who had um, Edison's, for example, and um, they were feeling tired and a bit lackluster and things like that. Um, I, um, uh, it's not, it's not even available here. So we have to get it from patients have to get it from Amazon if, if, if then if they want to. Uh, I've had a few patients who were um, using it um, for Edison related tiredness and it didn't work. So um, I was working on, I, I worked with someone who was part of this paper and I'll send you on that paper and it, that showed good results, but it, it didn't work for my patients. I'm not talking about Edison's. I'm talking I know, I know you're saying anti-aging. No, no, I, I don't think so. I don't no. think so. They will, um, they, they're um, uh, several things that they're using for anti-aging, but not this one. No. Thanks. So uh, if there are no more questions, I think we can wind up this session. So thank you very much, everyone, for being with us.